I want to welcome everyone to our sixth and final episode of the fall 2020 season of UT Southwestern Science Cafe. It's good to see you all this evening. I hope everyone's warm. For our regulars, welcome back. And for our new guests, we are so pleased to meet you. My name is Jenny King and I'm Director of Public Affairs here at UT Southwestern. And on behalf of my colleague, Corey Chopin, and our wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Albin, thank you for joining us tonight. Science cafes are online conversations where our speakers take you on deep dives into complex science topics. Yet, our format is casual. We try to be interactive as much as possible. And we have speakers that are UT Southwestern faculty as well as occasional invited special guests. Tonight, um, to keep that interactive um, front and center, we want to make sure you ask questions and engage with us during the program. And as we said, we are going to be discussing the science of healthy eating. Actually, I don't know if we said that. I think I just said Dr. Do Jacqueline Albin. Her topic is the science of healthy eating. We want to thank uh, Dr. Albin in advance. She's an assistant professor for joining us tonight. She is going to have a lot of interesting things to say and I, we welcome your question. Before we begin, there are always technical matters to mention, so here we go. We wanted to let you know that we're recording this program and we're also live streaming it tonight on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. We ask everyone to mute your microphone to help us with audio clarity and just unmute yourself if you are called on to ask a question during the Q&A portion. We encourage you to use the chat feature to list your questions for Dr. Altman, and that'll help us call on you. Corey is our wonderful Q&A facilitator. And one last one, uh, as a reminder, we cannot answer personal medical questions, but we would love to hear from you with general questions about the science of healthy eating. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jacqueline Alban is an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics and practices primary care, treating patients of all ages in the combined internal medicine and pediatrics med peds clinic at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Alban serves as the associate program director for the internal medicine pediatrics residency program as well, and she loves teaching about health promotion across the lifespan. In 2017, Dr. Alban launched UT Southwestern's culinary medicine program and serves as the director, working to teach nutrition through hands-on cooking classes to medical students, residents, fellows, healthcare professionals in the community. Last fall, colleagues in my department had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Alvin and see her culinary medicine program and practice, and it was really fun and I learned a lot and I know my colleagues did as well. Dr. Albin loves blending her passion for nutrition and wellness with growing a garden, cooking, traveling, and spending time with her husband and children. Dr. Albin, welcome to Science Cafe. The virtual program is yours. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I have actually, as, as much as they call this a deep dive, I like to think of this as the tip of the iceberg because this is actually a huge topic and we're, we're just gonna set a goal tonight to bring some clarity and hopefully simplicity to what has been very complicated. Uh, the journey to food and its role in health for me was a personal one, which is kind of a long story, but a lot of things that physicians become passionate about are something that affected someone they loved, and that was true for the role of food in health. And I've spent about the last 10 years of my career learning what I can and really fell in love with culinary medicine as a specialty and got certified and really love the opportunity that I have at UT Southwestern to teach it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're really going to seek to instill some hope that you can feel empowered in your own health with your diet. So we're gonna start with a question and hopefully this is the easiest one. What we eat is one of the most important things we can do to promote good health. Do you think that's true or false? All right, okay, so you guys already took the quiz correct before you've even heard my talk. So 99% of you say yes. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit of the, the high level data that we have around this. 
Um, all right, I think my slides are being grumpy. Here we go. So actually, we understand from large population-based studies that a poor diet is actually the number one risk factor for early death in the United States. So this is the globe, I'm sorry, the US burden of disease collaborators. We'll look at the global in a second. But if you look at the top here, these colors represent different flavors or causes of associated deaths. The purple's diabetes, the huge blue in the middle represents cardiovascular diseases, and then the lighter blue is cancer. So diets right here up at the top, and then you've got tobacco, and then the ones below that, high blood pressure, high BMI, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, all of those have significant linkages to diet. So the bulk of our risk factors for early death are modifiable by diet, which I see as good news, and we'll come back to that. So the next thing that I think is so important as we all are worried about, or at least I know those of us in healthcare, we think a lot about how expensive our healthcare system is. It's expensive for patients, it's expensive for our country, and the vast majority of the money that we're spending is on chronic disease. And about 75% of our country's spending is estimated to be from preventable chronic disease. So this is where my head explodes a little bit, you know, that emoji with mind blown, because we spend so much money treating conditions, and I believe we really are inadequate in our prevention approaches and our use of lifestyle patterns to be a solution and a strategy for people with any disease problem. Not that it's the only solution, but it's a big one. So I actually call this the good news slide because this is global burden of disease collaborators. And this group looked at the role of diet on death across the world. And they actually separated it out on the left. You see these different colored bars. Those represent income level of the countries involved. So there's a widespread of impact of diet on death across many different income levels. It's not just rich countries, it's not just poor countries, it's everyone. And then on the right, you see that most of these deaths by color, again, are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. So the middle is where I want your attention. And I put my, my key points here in green. The majority of food-related death are what? Are these a whole bunch of things that you need to wrist slap yourself about? Hopefully you see that and you see it's all the stuff that we aren't getting enough of. So with the exception of sodium, which takes home the prize, and, and by the way, this is not, I have this conversation in clinic with my patients all the time, this is not you using a little bit of the salt shaker on something you cooked. This is sodium that's in highly processed and packaged foods, highly processed meats, and things that are, that are already including way too much sodium, not the stuff you cook at home usually. But everything that follows that is the foods that promote longevity that we do not eat enough of in American diets and in global diets. And we're gonna look more at those specific foods. So I wanna stop here because some people get a little overwhelmed by this data. Diet is the number one cause of early death and it's actually in the top three for disability. And then globally, this is a problem. So is there, you know, what do we even do with this information? So I hope that you have some snacks because it's hard to talk about food while we're um, without anything to snack on. But I want to put a disclaimer out here that I love food. You probably love food and I'm not here to take away your favorite food. And that surprises some of my patients. I actually ask them, what is your favorite food? And that is not the food that we talk about changing because food has a lot of purposes in our life and pleasure is one of them. And I've, these are just pictures I've taken of my own family's food. And certainly we have a whole lot of the picture in the top left of fresh produce and color, but we also have things like the bottom right, which is actually, that's my son in the background about to consume that entire strawberry souffle on his, I think it was his eighth birthday. So treats are a part of life and loving food is a part of life. And we wanna frame that in this conversation. So here's my next question. And I think this one is important to many of us. How often do you eat something you love and then feel guilty about it? So we're gonna put that poll up. Some of the words my patients and family members will use are I cheated or I, I, have to, I was naughty. They'll actually use terms that we use to describe toddlers when they talk about their dietary indiscretions. So we're all across the board here. I'm really pleased to see that not many of you think about this multiple times a day, but, but lots of you think about it daily or weekly. 
And then um, there's, a, there's a third of you that think about it rarely, which is great. I hope to get all of you to the rarely or never category because food is not good or bad. It's just food. And we should have mindful choices about what food we put in our body without guilt or shame afterwards. So how, how do we do that? We'll, we'll hopefully give you some insight on that. All right, so this is the purpose put some thoughts here, and these are not in any particular order, but if, if you ask a kindergartner, why do we eat? It's, it's for energy. It's to, um, to get the nutrition that we need to grow. It's hopefully to fill full, satiety. We want to fill full, and it's promoting our health if we're choosing the right kinds of foods. And then social connection. I mean, could, it, could this year teach us any more about how much we crave the social connection over food? And then pleasure is certainly part of our diet. So I want to start with these three an initial take-home points. First is that we've established that food is central to health. I showed you two major epidemiological studies. There are hundreds more studies that support that conclusion. Even though nutrition science is a messy thing, we know that the, there's major linkage between food and our health outcomes and our quality of health. But we also know that we eat for a lot of reasons. Some of them are practical and some of them are very emotional. Some of them are for pleasure. And when we have a conversation about how to shift our diet towards one that promotes health and longevity, it should not be rooted in what we shouldn't have. And yes, there are all things, and we could pro probably tell our neighbor or a friend right now something we know that we probably have a little too much of. But that is not where we should build our foundation of making change. So. Another poll before we dive into some more content is how do you, and really what I'm looking at here is the distinction between some of us feel like we know what to do and we just don't do it, or maybe we are feel like so much misinformation. All right, so a lot of you already feel like you're there. You know what you should do and you think you do it. I would love for you to share your secrets because I would say most of my patients fall somewhere in the middle here. They know what they should eat for health and they struggle to implement it. To actually just establish for, for all of us that if lifestyle is such an important driver of chronic disease, why is it not more of a key therapeutic target? And and I, you know, I didn't actually make this a poll, but I should have of wondering how often you have these conversations with your medical teams because we're going to get in a second into how this is really not a big part of our education. So the, here's the confused. This and I actually took this picture last year about the same time, right before Thanksgiving. Look at this, the first thing that draws my eye was the bottom middle magazine. Slightly offended that people something, and then the. So. And then the one on the bottom right, eating plant-based, is actually completely different and quite disparate from a keto diet. And somebody could just stare at this for two minutes while they're waiting to check out and, and decide maybe they should just cook some pie and, and not even bother trying because no one seems to know which dietary approach we should be taking. Philosophical reason why I think that is the case for many of our patients is that the health community, I, I take responsibility. I feel like we have failed our patients and our community in really being the leading voice about the role of food and health and then the 
evidence base behind certain dietary patterns. It's something that you can easily find a blog about or a book about or anyone who's selling you something is out there. And these things go in cycles. A lot of the same popular diets come and then they go out of fashion and they come back in a different name. And so the cyclical attempt to make money off of people's desire to be told what to eat is not a new thing. But I think we in healthcare need to take greater collaboration with, with um, interprofessional approaches to how to eat better. So one of the reasons I mentioned earlier is that nutrition education in medical school is declining. And then it's, it's discouraging that if you don't get it in medical school, you don't get it in your subspecialty training. So one interesting study shows in cardiology where you think cardiologists, they ought to know a lot about nutrition, but they, they report that their, their nutrition training in residency and fellowship is very low. And what they got in medical school was their main contribution. So I love this quote um, from, from a recent publication that says, a poorly trained medical workforce, so people like me and all the residents that I train, we are part of the structural contribution to diet-related disease. If we don't dive into this and try to help our patients interpret what we understand about how much food impacts our health. So that brings me to just give you a brief introduction to culinary medicine as a concept. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about specific food and my ideas for how we sort of shift our culture. So the kitchen is a lab. And it, for those of you who are familiar with UT Southwestern, we ha have a research powerhouse. And I will admit I'm actually a novice researcher. I do mostly educational research and I've just started diving into clinical research as it applies to, to uh, culinary medicine. And this is an area that is growing across the country very rapidly. And it's the role that preparing food and understanding how cooking can improve our health and what, what role that plays in health education. So the first thing we try to teach is that there is no such thing as a perfect diet. There is a better diet. And actually the dietary pattern that's better is pretty similar for most people. There's some variability, but most people can improve their diet in the same ways as their neighbor or friends. And we, we want that to, to be better, not perfect. And then we know that that can be a key to health and longevity, but that it's more than just telling people what to eat. It's giving them the skills and the confidence and self-efficacy to actually implement it in their busy lives. And knowing the hours that my patients work and the other people in their homes that they're feeding, or how many mouths are they feeding? Are they cooking for one? Or are they cooking for six? All of those little details play into how I, I coach my patients and how really all health professionals should grow to coach patients. So at UC Southwestern, this is pre-pandemic photos here, of course, and all of these are, are students. Uh, the, the chef's coat right here is Millette Seiler, who is the registered dietitian that I partner with, and we, we co-teach everything. And she and I are both huge believers in culinary medicine. She's an oncology dietitian. And so she actually works with her patients very closely on the role that diet plays in different cancer risk and recurrence and also all the complications of cancer. We have a ton of fun, which you can see there's a lot of laughing and fun has to be infused in our educational approaches, especially when we're talking about change of something that's so integral to our daily lives. So our approach in our kitchen is very much food based. So we are cooking a meal and you see my students on a team here cooking together and they are leading the class. They prepare their food and they are coached on how what we made has a shift or a change to maybe what we might have traditionally cooked and how that affects health. It's interprofessional. We actually have our dietetic students co-leading and serving as peer mentors, as well as medical students that have graduated the class. And this year we have a physician assistant and physical therapy students in our class as well. So it's amazing how health professionals can come together because this is relevant to all of us. We talk about patient cases. We have case studies for the students. How do you apply dietary change to this patient's circumstances, whether it's food allergy or it's some sort of chronic condition that they're trying to improve? And we teach the students the evidence. We help them learn how to filter through nutrition science, which is messy. But I do want to say one thing about nutrition science, because that's a common critique, is that it's not as sound because you can't, you can't prove that broccoli 
cures something. You know, that's never going to be a thing because things are so multifactorial. But I would argue that the data that we need to say that broccoli improves our health is not have to be at the same level as the data that we need to say a cancer drug with a lot of side effects is effective. So the data for healthier eating is messier, but it's okay because we shouldn't need a strong of data to convince us to eat food that we already know to be highly nutritious. And then the last thing on here, I actually think is one of the selling points, because if you guys have been following the news or, or just the media in general, medical professionals were burned out before the pandemic. And the, the burden of electronic medical record systems and insurance regulations and many other reasons, people are worn out. And wellness has become a huge topic starting at the medical school level and teaching people who are busy and working hard to be empowered to prepare their own healthy food empowers them to then take it to their patients. And that's really one of our program goals. So this is actually my, um, my little daughter who um, was making a, she told me this was her culinary medicine class for her dolls. And I love this because yes, we have lots of fruits and vegetables and variety going on here, but we also have some cupcakes because that's absolutely not excluded from a healthier diet. But what, what does culinary medicine teach? Maybe not in the doll class, but in the real class, it teaches how food influences early death, how it influences prevention and treatment of chronic disease. What do we do with food allergy? Why is food allergy increasing? And how do we accommodate our family and friends with food allergy? How, if a patient wants to work on changing their weight, how does food influence that? And then role of inflammation in our food, which is, which is increasingly important because we're linking inflammatory food to a lot of our health conditions. And then a huge component of the way that we teach this is about mindfulness. Do we actually think about what we're eating? Or are we always distracted when we're eating? Is, is putting more attention to our food part of the solution? Whoops, I think I went too far. Um, there we go. So at UC Southwestern, we actually teach classes on Zoom right now to students who are across all specialties, residents and fellows. We teach it to, to practicing physicians. We teach it to staff teams and to groups on campus that are not clinical. And then we also teach specific disease condition classes to certain patient populations. That's, that's an area where we want to grow significantly. And we also are studying this, especially in diabetes, to see what the impact is in controlling diabetes. All right, so this is, what, this is what culinary medicine looks like right now on Zoom. And we've actually been really excited that people are engaged and they love cooking from their own space. They find that they feel encouraged that they can do that again. Here's a black bean mushroom taco that one of my students made and they share pictures and talk a lot about um, what the experience was like. And it helps us you know, with, with some of our patients and families that are lower income, we help them overcome some of the barriers they thought they had about substitutions or expensive ingredients. How can you use something different? So this slide right here summarizes basically all the evidence that we have around how we should be eating. And I want to draw your attention to the center, which is a graphic. And this, this is a wonderful 30 page read if you wanna really nerd it out with me. Moza Farian, um, he is at Tufts and he's a nutrition expert nationally. And he wrote this review for circulation about what is the evidence, especially around cardiovascular disease and it as our, our top diet related killer. The stuff in the blue at the top is strongly evidence-based. We need more of those foods. The stuff at the bottom is strongly evidence-based. We need less of those foods. And the stuff in the middle, the data is a little bit messier. So I, I always tell, tell my students, like, do, you know, don't die on the hill of the eggs because we have studies that support eggs and we have studies that question eggs. And in some populations, like people with diabetes, the eggs should probably be in moderation. But everything at the top, most Americans get it insufficiently. In fact, data shows on national population surveys that 75% of Americans do not meet their basic nutritional needs with their diet. So what is the diet that we sort of label this approach as? It's, it's commonly known as Mediterranean pattern of eating. And it doesn't mean that you live in Italy or France, but certainly a lot of the original research was, was done in some of the European countries. But consistently, the same results come out of these studies across 
many topics, whether we're looking at cardiovascular disease or cancer or stroke or cognitive function. And two things that are a little bit different than the specific foods are that culturally eating with others is a powerful positive. So we should emphasize, even if it's over an electronic means, we should emphasize the laughter and the enjoyment and the socialization that sharing a meal bring. And secondly, we want our foods to be as colorful and fresh as possible. So if you live near access to a farm, or you can buy things from a farmer's market, or you, you actually know that your food is in season. That's really kind of what I lean on, is I have a list on my refrigerator of what's in season, and I try to eat the fruits and vegetables that are in season, because that means they will have traveled less distance to get to me, and they're gonna have higher nutrient content when they spend less time in transit. So then when we go into what do the, what do the components of the actual foods consist of in Mediterranean diet research, it's these nine things, and actually most studies, determine a Mediterranean diet score based on meeting certain criteria. So they want a certain quantity, a minimum amount of vegetables, legumes, fruits and nuts, whole grains, fish, oils and fats, and then a, and they limit dairy, meat, and alcohol in moderation. So when you tier Mediterranean diet research, they're really standardizing it across the board on a score based on people meeting these nine points. So many, many studies, I've cited a few down here, but in general, people who improve their Mediterranean diet score or have a higher Mediterranean diet score show increased executive brain functioning, global cognition, memory, and, and we've already talked about longevity, just living longer. And then they show decreased heart disease, cancer, mood disorders, cognitive decline, all reasons for dying early. And I think we agree that if people live longer, we don't want them to live longer in a way that they're not enjoying life and have a high quality of life. So the balance of both living longer and reducing some of the diseases that create the biggest burden on quality of life is, is mutually important. And I think that's part of what the power of diet has. So I think the hard part can be that most of us, uh, you know, wonder like, what do I need to change? Should I change? And I always like to remind my patients that the slow and steady is what runs the race in this one. It, if you're talking about weight loss, you don't want it to be fast because fast weight loss rarely sticks because your body's metabolism literally fights it. So fast changes in our diet or in our lifestyle patterns are often something that we have a hard time sticking with, especially if they're drastic. So it's a long-term investment in those slow and steady tweaks and consistency with those things. And then once you master one or, small, one or two small things, then you move on to something else. So it can take a long time to get from point A to point B if you set a, a lofty goal for yourself, but that's the way it should be. So this was, this was a blog that um, I, I did earlier in the pandemic when people were really interested in like, what can we eat to boost our immune system? And I put this slide up here because I want to remind you that there isn't a magic bullet. There isn't a single food or a single nutrient that is the, you know, the oil of youth or the wellness potion. And we have to pursue variety and moderation and balance. So if we want to support our immune function, in addition to our, our other areas of health, we have to have we have to have a blend of all the foods that contribute these things to our body. So how do you do that? One of the ways that's probably the single most important thing is what I call eating the rainbow. So this, this is something we do for if you have grandchildren or children. Uh, children, they don't like something on their plate that looks unfamiliar. And my children are no different, despite my area of research and passion. So we do a lot of this, which I call muffin tin dinner. And my kids love it because it brings choice. And guess what? This thing is empty every time. And I don't know who exactly ate what, but it all gets eaten. And the beauty is that having variety and color in every meal, but not feeling like we're the one who necessarily has to consume a certain portion of everything is a freeing concept for people who are trying something new. So if you have people in your house that are resistant to new foods, try something like this, or, or you do a board of a lot of different types of food where people feel like they have choice. But the more color we can get into each of our meals, the better. And the reason for that is because of the phytochemical and antioxidant benefit. 
So phytochemicals are unique components in fruits and vegetables, and also in other plant-based foods, even things like coffee and chocolate. We'll talk about chocolate in a minute and tea. But phytochemicals have an impact on our health that is still not fully understood. The one, one of the ones we understand the most is lycopene, which is in tomatoes. But there are many things to learn about what these phytochemicals have. Many phytochemicals are antioxidants, but not all of them. And there are antioxidants that are not phytochemicals. So there's a little bit of overlap in that concept. But what does an antioxidant do? It basically, as you see in this little graphic, the yellow, it stabilizes, it donates to an unstable molecule. And it allows that unstable molecule to stabilize and thus prevent DNA damage. So we have cellular damage is what leads to things like cancer. It is, it is something that, that comes from damage in our environment, from a poor diet, from tobacco, from exposures, and just from age and living life. And that's called, over time, we get a lot of oxidative stress from these free radicals. And you don't want that free radical molecule to be allowed to go wild and antioxidants will help reverse it. So to get all the antioxidants that you need in your diet, you need dietary diversity. And each color of our fruits and vegetables represent a phytochemical that has specific benefits. And this is not at all a comprehensive list. There are about 5,000 phytochemicals that we know of. And the important thing to know, I actually put this at the bottom, phytochemicals are in the food, but we cannot successfully isolate them and put them in pill form. That has been actually supplements in general have been a very disappointing approach to try to get certain nutrients. Many times we think supplements are successful and then later we find actually it's probably the food and there were some component in the food that made that unique nutrient valuable. There was just a big upset in the cardiology community because we've been thinking that omega-3 fat supplements were really helpful and a study came out that showed in some populations it's really not. It might actually be harmful for some people and that's an individual decision with your doctor but it just took me back to let's get it from our food. So I'm not going to read these to you, but just a reminder that eating the rainbow gets you very different nutrient benefits from a phytochemical standpoint, and we want to get all of them on our plate every day or every other day. Okay, so this is something that people have a lot of different ideas about usually. What is the recommended number of servings of fruits and vegetables to get in a day for maximal benefit? I'm curious to see what you guys think about this one. All right, so, okay, I'm glad that most folks say, do not think it's one to two. Um, actually, many of my patients tell me that's all they get when they actually think about their daily diet because it's not part of our culture to have fruits and vegetables included in a, in a lot of our meals and it takes some intentionality. So five to six um, is, is a, definitely meets a lot of recommendations. The data interestingly shows a dose dependent response, meaning that for each increased dose, each increased serving of fruit or vegetable that you get every day, you have a decreased uh, early death. And that goes all the way up to eight. And so I don't actually think it's practical for everyone to get eight, especially if you're living a very busy life, it would be challenging to get eight in a day. But I think five is a great goal. Five to six is a great goal. So another food that I think doesn't get enough attention, and maybe because it makes some people gassy, is legumes. But legumes are a wonderful food, and they're very consistently in diets of people who are shown to have the best longevity. And we'll actually end on that note, looking at the blue zones. But lentils, green peas, okra, beans, uh, we want legumes in our diet. If you have a little digestive trouble, you introduce them gradually, and your body will adjust. And many times soaking or rinsing beans can be helpful too. The reason we love beans in culinary medicine is that they're cheap, they're a wonderful source of protein, they pair well with most meals, they're usually well accepted by children because they have a really mild flavor, and then they're also rich in micronutrients that sometimes we don't get enough of. 
So another, another thing I like to debunk a lot, and I think most of you probably know this because there's been such a shift in messaging, but as, you know, as a child of the 80s, I definitely spent a whole year trying to eat fat-free, and we were very much anti-fat. Fat was on the bad list. Now it's kind of more carbohydrates, but fat was the, the demonized nutrient for a, a, quite a while, and this was based on some faulty data that, that had actually been uh, falsified, and that's a long story, but but telling telling the public that fat was the cause of heart disease, when in fact, many healthy types of fat are what we need to protect our heart. And omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory. And people often get confused about omega-3 versus omega-6 fats. And the key there is that omega-3 fats, which exist mostly in uh, nuts like walnuts, certain types of oils, including some in olive oil, fatty fish, and then seeds like chia seeds and flax seeds, omega-3 fats have a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. And when they're out of balance with omega-6 fats is when we get inflammation because omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory. Omega-6 fats are probably the biggest culprit is things like sunflower, soft flower oils that are in a lot of processed and packaged foods and even salad dressings. They are loaded with omega-6 fats. And then we also have a lot of um, animal products that are, that are rich in omega-6 fats. Saturated fat is not in and of itself a no-go, but it needs to be a lower part of our total fat intake where at least 75% or so of your fat intake is the unsaturated types. And I've you know, listed some things that are common at the bottom that are great sources of unsaturated fat, but we do not promote a low fat diet. And that's, you know, that's an important shift. All right, we just have a few more things and we'll stop for questions. So chocolate, I like to remind everyone, it is a wonderful source of flavanols. Treating yourself should be part of your life. And there's actually data that chocolate might increase blood flow to the brain. And if you're going to eat it for pleasure, you eat whatever kind you want. But if you're eating it for nutrition, you wanna choose a darker variety and one that's not processed with alkali or Dutch processed as that processing actually takes out all of the phytochemicals, the flavanols. And then, in, in sort of totality, let's, let's always remember that food is not bad or good, it's just food, but we do wanna strive for quality and we wanna strive for improving access. Um, but one thing that I think is important is that our culture normalizes poor eating and activity behaviors. So it's not just about making individual shifts, but how do we culturally shift? Does every reward that we have have to be about pleasure food? Can we celebrate without it being just about food? And how can social events prioritize activity? How can we be countercultural? And in the spirit of the season, this is last year's Santa plate where my kids, I just told them to make a Santa plate and they put blueberries and carrots and a little chocolate. And they said, Santa needs to get his fruits and vegetables. And, and in, you know, this, this is a model that that's part of our value system. And on the right, we have, we have the Halloween basket. Does it have to be about um, candy? It doesn't. And so, to conclude, I want to summarize with the fact that there's more than one right way to do this, that we can culturally apply these principles, and your diet and my diet might not look the same as long as we're all pursuing the same general principles. And I think if you have a chance, you should check out the Blue Zones research, which is a fascinating anthropology study looking at the people groups across the world who live the longest, but also have great quality of life. And so it's heavy vegetables, it's, it's turmeric and spices, it's active lifestyles, it's eating lots of, again, fruits, vegetables, grains, and then just, just keeping the body moving. So we can take those principles and apply, apply them to our life. You can never go wrong with these four things that they concluded from Blue Zones, which is whole grains, nuts, beans, fruits, and vegetables. And hopefully that leaves you with the conclusions that you agree with me that there isn't just one thing to do for better nutrition, but it's about consistency and color. And we don't want to hold ourselves to an unrealistic standard. So we just want to do better, not perfect. And we all have room to do better. So I encourage you to try to think of one to two things that you want to work on. And I, I do like to do some food stuff on social media if you do social media. And with that, I'll stop sharing and we can chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvin. That was amazing. And I'm glad I don't have to feel guilty for all of the things I've eaten today. <laughs>
Um, we are going to go ahead and move to questions. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions from a lot of people, so I will ask that you limit yourself to one question. Um, and if we have time, we'll come back and call on you again. But again, just so that you can get to as many people um, as we can, if you could please limit to one question. So our first question comes from Sandy Parker. You, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and doc ask Dr. Alvin your question. I'm going to give me a second. Okay, well, I will come back to you, Sandy, if you get yourself unmuted and move to Bob Chenney. You had some questions for Dr. Alvin? Tricky to find the unmute. Okay, hi. Um, I have, I have a, hi, doctor. Uh, how many grams is too little then when you say you do not promote a low fat diet? I, my wife and I have been aiming for about 45 grams a day of total fat. You know, that sounds reasonable. There is some variability by your individual health condition. So I, I usually won't recommend for individuals. Um, but if you, if you are working towards particular health goals or you want to make sure it's in balance, ask your medical team to get you in with a dietitian because I think we definitely underutilize getting their advice for just longevity health. So I would, I would encourage that, but that sounds pretty reasonable. Thanks. All right, moving on to our next question is from Mary Whitmore. Mary, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Dr. Alvin your question? Yes, um, uh, so what about alcohol, wine specifically, you know? Yeah, great question. Sugars, you know? <laughs> So in most Mediterranean cultures and diet studies, alcohol is included and there appears to be benefit for moderate consumption for most people. And by they define that as one glass of wine per day for women and two for men. That's not something you can like save up and all have on Saturday. And most Mediterranean diet studies are consuming alcohol with a meal, not at 10 o'clock at night. And so I, there's, there's some evidence that the benefit of antioxidant absorption, particularly from red wine, might be better when you're eating it with food. That being said, I do not encourage people to start aren't drinking for health if they're not drinking. I don't think the evidence is strong enough to say that, but if you enjoy wine, which is probably our only evidence-based, strongly evidence-based source of alcohol, that's something that that is quite reasonable to continue. And I, I personally choose to have a glass of red wine several days a week. And I would also add that this is very individual and we all have to make these choices around those in our families and friend circles who might struggle with alcoholism. So there's not a one size fits all answer there, but wine, especially red wine with food in moderation is in most Mediterranean studies. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from um, Subara Yudu. Um, I know you've asked a bunch of questions, so if you wanna pick your top one to ask right now, um, we will try and come back to you later. If you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, just a second. Who did you call on? Uh, Subar Yudu has asked a bunch of questions in the chat box. I want to give just a second and try and help. He said, him. "Flip a coin and ask a question." I'm sorry, Stu. He said, "He said, just flip a coin." And <laughs> oh no, he just said, "I'm audio challenged." Okay. Um, I will go ahead um, and go through and pick one. Um, I actually thought this one was really great. And he said, what are good omega-3 options for vegetarians? Yeah, um, so the only non-vegetarian option is, is uh, fatty fish. And so the, the great vegetarian options, I actually think the easiest thing to incorporate in your diet is chia seeds. That's a wonderful source. If anybody doesn't know they come in a bag and they're tiny little seeds that when they're in a liquid they expand to about 20 times of their size and they're perfect to just take like a teaspoon and sprinkle it on oatmeal or in a smoothie or in on yogurt they have no taste and uh, the only complaint i get from people is they do get stuck in your teeth so you'll have to make sure you brush really well and floss but it's a wonderful source flax seeds walnuts olive oil all great sources of omega-3s 
Great. Um, thank you. Our next question um, comes from Susan Watkins and um, she does not have audio. So I'm going to go ahead and ask her question as well. Um, are there any meal delivery services that you recommend? There's so many out there. It's kind of confusing. Is there anyone that's been kind of proven to be most effective? You know, I'm going to have to claim lack of enough knowledge about that. Uh, we actually cook all of our food. My husband and I kind of as a 50-50 team. Um, but I, I think that meal delivery is a great source of making it easier to prepare food at home. So I would, I would try one out. A lot of them have free trials. And if, you know, getting cooking into your busy lifestyle might be helped by using a meal delivery service, go for it. It is definitely likely to be healthier than something you might get at a fast food restaurant. And so, so just give it a go. Look for that same set of principles we talked about, whole grains, variety, colorful produce. Those are your key markers for a good option. Great. Our next question comes from Rick Press. Rick, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Albin. Um, my question was, I've been reading a lot about belly fat lately and the, the dangers of that. And are there specific foods that contribute more to that or contribute less to that? So there are a lot of opinions about that. Um, I don't think that we have our finger on precisely the answer or that it's necessarily even the same for everyone. And you're right that fat that is close to the heart, if, if you carry fat higher up on the body, it does have an association with higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And it also often means that there's fat deposits on the organs, the liver, et cetera. And those are all risky for metabolic disease. So I, I think Eating, again, eating a Mediterranean-style pattern that's moderate in fat but rich in fiber seems to reduce weight gain in all studies, and so any type of weight gain. But there are also certain strategies to reducing belly fat around eating, and, and that's a great, a great thing for anyone who's worried about that to check with their doctor. And if your doctor doesn't know, which they might not, definitely ask to talk to a dietitian. Thank you. Our next question comes from Linda. Linda Blasier, do you have a question for Dr. Alban? Yes, I had asked about um, needing more information on anti-inflammatory foods. Um, I take a lot of supplements for anti-inflammatory, um, try to eat healthy varieties and colors of food, but I really don't know which ones to target most uh, with that, I, I um, have some inflammation that I deal with, and I'd like to do more about getting to it, if I could, yeah. with diet more so than supplements and things like that. So this is a hot area of research, and I don't think we understand all the mechanisms of anti-inflammation in food. Certainly some of it comes from what I was uh, touching on with antioxidants and phytochemicals. So the more fruits and vegetables, those are all anti-inflammatory, some more so than others. Mm. Herbs and spices, which I think is great news, right? Because herbs and spices add wonderful flavor to our food. And mm. there's a lot of attention on turmeric. Uh, I always remind people two things about turmeric. One is that there's no evidence that the supplements are actually any better than, and, or even beneficial. Whereas the spice in your diet is something that I would encourage everyone to do. Turmeric's pretty mm. mild. So even just adding it to like if you're going to make brown rice, throw in a teaspoon of turmeric in, into the pot. Oh. And a key note is the key anti-inflammatory ingredient in turmeric is activated by black pepper. So you don't get any benefit out of it if there's not black pepper with it. Mm -hmm. And most supplements don't even know these things. You can look at the bottle and you're like, oh, well, that's a useless supplement because it doesn't, it doesn't um, open it doesn't open up the effective properties of turmeric. So herbs and spices, fruits and vegetables, and honestly, some of the things that increase inflammation, those processed and packaged foods, a lot of animal protein, a lot of dairy, those tend to be inflammatory to many people. So cutting down the portions of those and increasing the plant-based foods. Um, supplements are a very individualized question. So talk with your doctor about that. I don't recommend supplements for most people unless they have food allergies or a restrictive diet because we can get most of our nutrients from a diverse diet. Thank you. 
You're welcome. That was a great question. I had no idea about the black pepper um, and, and I've used the turmeric, so that, that's great to know. Um, our next question comes from our good friends, Jan and Tom. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and unmute yourselves, happy to see you again. Nice to see you. Yes. Um, my question was, what's the difference between the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet? Great question. So, I mean, frankly, the Mediterranean diet is just a little bit sexier and got more attention. The DASH diet is a slightly Americanized version that is extremely evidence-based and is very effective at lowering blood pressure. Um, but the DASH diet adds a little bit more dairy and a little bit more sugar. It, it, it's just like helping Americans feel better about it is really how the DASH diet was developed. But it was developed by top leading institutions, is evidence-based and is very effective as well. So uh, you, following a DASH diet is a great strategy and it's very similar. It just didn't get the same traction. Thank you. Our next question comes from Seth Miller, which kind of plays off the last question. Seth, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure. Hey, Dr. Alvin. Great talk. Hey, I'm wondering, um, are there any specific apps or websites that you recommend that help people transition and implement a Mediterranean diet? That, that's also a good question. And I struggle because I think there, there are some great institutional websites, but there's a lot of variability in the random websites that you'll find. Um, I will tell you culinarymedicine.org, which is the national organization of, uh, it's really a physician chef dietitian partnership organization where we create recipes and content to educate around food as medicine. They have free recipes on the website and handouts too, actually. And they're all Mediterranean diet rooted. So that's culinarymedicine.org. Just look for the free recipes. And I think looking at health center websites is another great strategy. I'm actually um, working with teams to hopefully build out ours further, but but looking for institutions that have dietitians and physicians involved in in recommending it is probably the safest approach. But remember, one small change. Don't overwhelm yourself with too many things at once. Um, thank you. Our next question comes from Grace. Grace, we're so happy to see you again. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. All right. Thank you. Mine was very similar to his, and that was there's so much conflicting information. I love that you you did the magazine thing at the checkout because I can see how if you don't know very much, you would just kind of throw up your hands and say, I'm just going to keep on eating whatever because who knows? Or like somebody said, or you talk, gave the example about egg research changing. So it's a, real, it's a good follow-up to what you mentioned. You said that UT Southwestern has one. I, I usually, if somebody has me a question, I send them to American Dietary Association. But if UT Southwestern has one, could you tell us what that is? As you mentioned. Well, so we don't actually have a, a well-developed section yet around culinary medicine, nutrition, Mediterranean diet. That's something that folks are working on. There's a lot of blog posts on the UT Southwestern med blog. So the, those are great. There's, I've written a few, our dietitians write them often and they post recipes there as well. So, so I would check that out and then, um, I oh, I will tell you there is one really great app that is by uh, Sloan Kettering around the use of herbs and their health benefits. It's called About Herbs, and it is a helpful review of supplements and herbs if you want to look into how their health properties might influence your diet. And that's uh, my oncology dietitian partner recommends that often. And I think that the misinformation is one of our biggest problems. We, we have not consolidated as individuals in healthcare, we have not consolidated the messaging. That's really one of my biggest goals from a career standpoint is how do we, how do we make sure health care professionals all have the same evidence-based knowledge so that when you have an appointment, you get accurate information instead of disparate information and that you can then empower yourself to, to make the changes over time. Um, I do, I, I'm also noticing a couple of folks mentioning Naturally Slim, which is a UT Southwestern sponsored program for those that are at UT Southwestern. That's a great resource and gives you some, some lifestyle change support. But I think in general, when you're making a shift, when you're wanting to, to know where to begin, you just can't go wrong with more fruits and vegetables. Like I think intentionality on that is the best thing to start. So I'll often ask my patients, like, do you eat breakfast? And if you eat breakfast, uh, are you more of an oatmeal person or maybe you're eating some eggs? And so if people, if we've got egg people, 
what what do most Americans like with their eggs? You all know it's a little bit of bacon. And I actually, one of my patients admitted to me recently that he was eating four pieces of bacon every day. So I'm not going to take away all the bacon from that guy, right? I'm going to help him get down to one piece by maybe, okay, he, he had time to cook breakfast. So we talked about, can you chop up a bell pepper and some onion, saute it in a little oil and add that to your eggs for flavor to cut down on the bacon. So we don't have to take away something that you love, but can we reduce it? Because we know adding something good and taking out something that's not as beneficial will really help him. And there, there you go. There's a serving of vegetables. Or if you eat oatmeal, make sure there's fruit and chia seeds on it. You know, how can you incorporate it into stuff you already like? In culinary medicine class, we, we have one session that's entirely about tacos. And we talk about how you can get a whole grain with a corn tortilla or a whole wheat flour tortilla. You can get legumes by having black beans. You can get all kinds of veggies, whether it's cabbage or lettuce or tomatoes or avocado, or sometimes you might want to do something like a mango salsa. You can get lots of different veggies in a taco and you don't even necessarily need any meat. You can eliminate meat sometimes from something like a taco and you won't miss it. So how do you incorporate the foods that are good for you in the foods that you already eat? So if you're going to make a pasta dish, add vegetables. I love to do like a pesto pasta with broccoli. You know, how do we get veggies into the stuff we already love? Um, that, those are all great suggestions. And I am actually, there, we've gotten a couple questions privately to me asking two questions that I'm just going to quickly ask you before moving on. But one, um, there's a lot of misinformation about coconut oil and whether it is good or bad. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, that's a common question. Okay, so um, coconut oil is a saturated fat. So any, any solid at room temperature is probably a saturated fat. So what, it, what else is saturated? Cheese, butter, and all types of animal protein, all types of meat. So most of the research about the harms of excess saturated fat are based on animal protein studies not really coconut oil. Coconut oil is a, a plant-based saturated fat. And one of the reasons why some specialists think it might be a little different is that it's mostly made up of what we call medium chain triglycerides or MCTs, which are a little bit more quickly absorbed by the body and utilized often right off the bat in ways that other saturated fats are not. But the verdict is still out. So my answer to that is use in moderation if you like it, but, but make sure you keep it in its place with more of the unsaturated fats. Um, I, I don't really use coconut oil, but I do use coconut milk sometimes in vegetable curries. That's one of my favorite um, completions of a great vegetable curry. So, so it's a food that we don't necessarily need to eliminate, but we shouldn't embrace it wholeheartedly because the data is incomplete about whether or not it gets special treatment since it's a plant-based saturated fat or not, because we just don't know. Thank you. Our next question that um, we've gotten a couple of is about intermittent fasting. Um, you, you read a lot about it, both from celebrities and in the news. Is it something that is recommended and healthy, or is it something that, you know, we should sure. steer so that, I love that question because I've actually become a cautious adopter of recommending intermittent fasting to some of my patients because many of my patients just feel frustrated. And uh, I hope you've seen that my message is not about weight loss. My message is about the lifestyle patterns that shift you towards healthier living. And if weight loss happens, great, but I don't think that needs to be the primary goal. I think that it's a win if you make a healthy lifestyle change, whether or not you lose weight, right? You get benefit from being more metabolically healthy whether or not the weight follows. And so I really de-emphasize weight loss, but intermittent fasting does seem to cause weight loss for most of my patients. And there are many ways to do it and it depends on your health conditions and you need to make sure you're not pregnant or nursing or with a certain health condition that might be at risk like treated for diabetes. But I would, um, I would say that intermittent fasting is an option for a lot of people and can be really successful. I, I have my, um, a couple of my relatives on it. And it's something that I even occasionally practice. And I find that time restricted feeding, doing a, a, a fast each day, that's maybe means I eat in a six to eight hour window. That's a really 
uh, adaptable strategy that a lot of people can make part of their daily life. Like maybe you eat from eight to four or 12 to six. You, I mean, I'm sorry, 12 to six, 12 to eight. You cut out nighttime eating, nighttime snacking, uh, have a cup of tea or something instead of eating. And that's a great way to just reduce those, some of those extra sources of calories that we don't want in our diet anyway. So I think it's a great option and there's a lot of promise. It seems to reset metabolism for many people who have impaired fasting glucose or prediabetes or diabetes. So I, I'm by no means an IF expert, but I think it's promising, worth talking about with your medical team. And my main point for everything about whether or not you should do it is can you sustain it? Because the things that are difficult to sustain are the things that we're gonna yo-yo. And it's more inflammatory to our bodies to have up and down in our patterns and our weight than it is to sort of be steady. So anything you think you can stick to is worth doing. Thank you. And we are pretty much out of time. Um, if your question is not can answered, uh, please feel free to email us at publicaffairs at utsouthwestern.edu. And we will work with Dr. Alvin um, responses to you, as well as if you want a copy of um, the slides that we just saw, um, we will coordinate with Dr. Alvin in getting you some information. Um, I am going to pass back to Jenny to go ahead and close us out. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alvin. Terrific conversation to our guest. Thank you so much for all of your questions. It was really great to learn with you about our physical health and how it's connected to our diet and how food science is changing the landscape of medicine. Corey, thanks as always for being our tech guru and moderating Q&A. Everyone tonight, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed our Science Cafe. As always, look for an email tomorrow or super soon thereafter with a brief survey about our program. We really value your feedback and wanna know what you think, wanna know what you want to learn next. We'll be taking a short break for the holidays and we're gonna return in January for the winter season. So please continue to watch your email in the coming weeks for more information about that. As we close out our cafe, from all of us at UT Southwestern, please continue to wear your masks, maintain physical distance in group situations, try to stay home, practice good hand hygiene. We really need to um, do our part uh, to work on reducing COVID in North Texas. Uh, we wish you, besides that, we do wish you good health, good spirits, and a good rest of your evening. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Let's have some hope for a great new year. And we are adjourned. Thank you so much.